and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Civil and Environmental Engineering graduation celebration for the class of 2023. Would you now please rise to recognize the faculty and graduates of CEE 2023.
graduates, faculty, friends, families, and guests, please be seated. Welcome everyone to the 2023 Civil and Environmental Engineering Graduate Celebration. Welcome to all our graduates, our faculty, our staff, and our speakers, but an especially warm welcome to all the family and friends who have joined us to celebrate this major milestone in the personal and professional lives of our graduates. My name is Bart Nyssen, and I'm the Chair of Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, and in that capacity, will lead today's proceedings. As has been customary in recent graduation ceremonies, we will begin with a land and slavery acknowledgement, followed by opening remarks from me, student reflections, student awards, our keynote speaker, and a summary of the accomplishments of our student organizations. We will then proceed with the individual recognition of all our graduates. The land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Puyallup, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. The slavery acknowledgement, racial oppression is deeply rooted in our nation's history, from the mass exploitation and mistreatment of Native American populations to the enslavement of black Americans. We acknowledge this past as an essential step forward in creating a more just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive future. All right. So today's ceremony is the culmination of a major educational endeavor of all of our graduates and a major milestone in their personal and professional lives. This academic year, we have nearly 300 graduates and are conferring 142 undergraduate degrees 130 master's degrees, and 20 doctoral degrees. Congratulations to every single one of you, and I will say this a couple of times tonight. You should be very proud of your accomplishments. This academic year has been interesting. We've been back in person after three strange years. In March 2020, the university became an online institution practically overnight, and the road back to in-person education has been bumpy for everyone involved. You have persevered in your education under difficult circumstances and admired the resilience of our civil and environmental engineering community in pulling through. When I took on the role of department chair at the start of this academic year, I had identified three major goals for our department. First and foremost was the need to rebuild community. Students have been instrumental in making this happen. They took the lead in organizing new events, such as the spring formal and the regular work from the office days, in which students provided refreshments during the morning to motivate each other to come together and work from the office. As we will hear later, the student organizations also rallied in joining competi national competitions and participating in professional events. Much work remains to be done in, re in rebuilding community but we are well on their way, thanks to your efforts. The second goal has been to emphasize student recruitment at all levels. While civil engineering is one of the oldest engineering departments at the University of Washington, the growth in our department has not kept pace with that of some of the other departments in the College of Engineering. Even though engineering students express a desire to make a difference in the world, civil and environmental engineering is not always on their radar. Growth as a, as a department is not a goal in itself. The demand for our graduates is great, as evidenced by the health healthy job market and the large number of employers that participate in our career fair. Civil and environmental engineers have an important goal, to solve the problems and critical challenges of the 21st century, from transportation to water quality to earthquake resilience Civil and environmental engineers play a crucial, crucial role in enabling livable, sustainable cities, healthy environments, and strong economies. Civil and environmental engineers design, build, operate, and maintain urban environments to improve people's lives. To put it succinctly, civil and environmental engineers build and manage the world of the 21st century, and they do this in a wide range of careers. You will all be part of this. 
and are graduating in a very strong job market where companies are vying for your skills. The third goal has been the formulation of a new strategic plan for our department, a process that took nearly a year and in which all sectors of the community participated. As a department, our mission is to lead efforts to prepare for a rapidly changing world, from combating the climate crisis to designing solutions that support an equitable future. We are at the forefront of interdisciplinary research, teaching and collaboration, embracing emergent tools and technologies to enhance the well-being of our communities as we create resilience in the built and natural environment. The strategic plan addresses education, visibility and engagement, culture, diversity, equity and inclusion, and lists four grand challenges that we should address in our teaching, research and professional lives. The four grand challenges focus on creating a resilient and sustainable world and are designing for a changing climate, creating resilience to natural hazards, building sustainable infrastructure, and engineering for socioeconomic and environmental justice. We are already active in each of these areas, and our graduates will play an important role in addressing these challenges. I invite you all to take a look at this strategic plan, which is highlighted on our website. Before I conclude my opening remarks, I want to say what a privilege it is to be the chair of this department. I did my PhD here in the 90s and returned to the University of Washington about a decade ago after time at another academic institution and an in industry. We have an amazing community, including students, staff, faculty, alumni, and their friends and family. I am humbled and inspired by the creativity, energy, commitment, and resilience from everyone, and it gives me great hope for the future. I trust that many of the contacts you have made during your time as students in this department will endure in your professional careers. Congratulations to all of you on getting your degrees. Lastly, a heartfelt thank you to all of you who, ha who are here to celebrate our graduates. They would not have been made it this far without your help and support. You should be proud of them and of your own roles in getting them here. With that, we move on to the next step in our program, where we will hear from some of our graduates. As our first speaker, I would like to invite Rohan Serene to the podium. Rohan is a transfer student from Shoreline Community College and will be completing his Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering degree this coming week. Rohan's peers celebrate him as a community leader in our department. This quarter, he's participating in the transportation and construction capstone and will be staying in Seattle to start his new role as a product manager at a general contractor. Rohan, uh, I don't know. Do you have your Thank you, Bart, for that speech and introduction. That was great. There's a few folders down here, so everyone be patient with me while I find my speech. <laughs> ah, okay. Got it. <laughs> you guys made it confusing on purpose, huh? Hello, esteemed colleagues, faculty, family, and friends. My name is Rohan Sareen, and thank you for joining us on this momentous occasion. I feel that no words I speak can truly encapsulate the importance of this moment, but I'm gonna try anyways. I came into the CEE department under atypical circumstances. After not being admitted to the major I applied to, I emailed our advisors asking for a late admittance. Their fantastic cooperation is what brought me into the department. That's why today, I'm immensely honored to be on this podium thanks to the generosity of our faculty. To be, a, to be part of a department that is so inclusive is something I'll always be grateful for, because without that, I would not be here. As I look around, I realize that this is a moment we'll never forget, and I now encourage all my fellow graduates to do the same. As we reflect together on our experience, let's remember how we got to this arena today, one step at a time. On behalf of the CEE class of 2023, I would like to thank those who made this moment possible. To our staff, professors, advisors, and the University of Washington, 
who provided us with the support and resources we needed to succeed in college, not only academically, but socially as well. We knew that through our struggles in school, we were never alone, and we would not be sitting in this arena today without all of you, so we thank you. To our friends and family, who without their continual support, we would not be able to get through the difficult times in our lives. When we need people to lift us up when we're down, when we need people to laugh with, when we need people to talk to, or just when we need some good company, we know we can always turn to you. And for that, we thank you. To our classmates, who are there to work with us, who are there to learn with us, who are there to tell us that it's okay and they didn't do good on that exam either, who gave us the determined and resilient community we needed to get this far, I thank you. Graduates, we've had help from so many different people to get to this point, and no amount of thanks I give can pay justice to them. With the support of everyone behind us, we each went through the journeys that led us to this moment, and we all got here, one step at a time. In September 2021, the university returned to the first in-person quarter since the pandemic began. For me, this was exciting. However, the transition from the virtual world back to the physical world was also very uncomfortable. On top of the extreme lifestyle shock of returning to class in person, we were enrolled in some of the most rigorous courses that we had taken until that point, like fluid mechanics, geotechnical engineering, and structural analysis. This was not an easy time for us by any measure, though amidst the national pandemic, we still persevered through it, one step at a time. For us undergraduates, our junior year was exciting, challenging, and enriching. We had just come out of a lockdown, and were finally getting the in-person interaction we deeply craved. We all came from different backgrounds. Some people were from different states or countries, some were from different colleges, and some were already at the University of Washington. The diversity of these backgrounds created such a unique cohort with a range of ages and perspectives. Everyone was able to find a friend in someone. Combined with the inclusivity that seems characteristic of our graduating class, this created a strong sense of community that we had lost as students since the pandemic began. For this, myself and the rest of our graduating class are extremely grateful. With this strong network of peer support, we are all able to succeed in a highly arduous academic year. All the courses we took would have been much more challenging had we not found friends to work with, and not to mention the professors and the TAs that helped us along the way. At the end of the year, I'm sure that you were all filled with as much of a sense of accomplishment as I was. After nine high-level courses, if not more for some, our tenacity paid off and we made it through the year. Class by class, assignment by assignment, day by day, we pushed, one step at a time. That brings us to this year. I first want to say to the entire CEE class of 2023, congratulations. Looking out now at this assemblage of graduates, I don't just see accomplished students. For those going into higher education, I see scholars. For those going into their careers, I see professionals. Throughout this year, we have developed a greater personal sense of our career goals within civil and environmental engineering. Our capstone courses and career experiences have given us the technical skill set we need to be highly contributing members of society. Though we're not taking as many classes together as we were our first year in the program, the sense of community we built stands paramount. The last two years were laborious and demanding, filled with laughter and tears and a lot of OneNote pages. It truly has been an adventure, and I have a deep appreciation for our graduating class for helping each other get to this point. We're not alone. We had each other's help at every point, and we all got through it, one step at a time. Somebody we all know and love, Bill Nye, once said, there's nothing I believe in more than getting people interested in science and engineering for tomorrow, for all of humankind. And I don't think that statement has ever held more true than with our program. We, as civil and environmental engineers, are building society, road by road, bridge by bridge, building by building. In my time spent in the program, I've been awed by the work ethic and studiousness of people that I've met. There is no doubt in my mind that we will all go on to do amazing things in this world. While I was writing the speech, Someone dear to me reminded me that it's not about where we end up, but the journey that gets us there. The lives we will affect and improve throughout our professional careers will be innumerable, and I look forward to seeing how we improve the world. Growing up, I never thought that I would be given anything close to an opportunity like this. I never had many friends, so that's why when my classmates this year told me they were nominating me as a student speaker, I was beyond moved. The life lessons, memories, and relationships I've created are things that I will truly, truly cherish forever. To the CEE graduating class of 2023, congratulations and what a job well done. 
I'm ecstatic to see where we all go in our future journeys. And I hope this speech helps you to remember to take things. And if you know what I'm going to say, you can join in one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. Our second speaker is Ingrid Phillips. Ingrid, please join me here on the podium. <laughs> yes, please, in general, be loud. It's OK. <laughs> Ingrid came to the UW as a running start student from Everett Community College. Ingrid is on the Dean's List and is focused on hydrology and hydrodynamics, which is also my own area, and is, a pa is passionate about water. As an active member of the Undergraduate Student Advisory Board, Ingrid has served as a member, student member of the Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee and <laughs> contributed to the success of this committee. Ingrid, and I'll help you this time. <laughs> okay. Okay, where is it? Is it that one? Yes. Oh, no, it's not. This is Rohan. <laughs> sorry. Oh, it's in here then. I don't think I'm sorry about this. We should have. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> it's really crazy to have a really big picture of yourself, like right up there. So <laughs> give me some grace. Um, hi everyone, my name is Ingrid. First of all, I'd like to thank Rohan for breaking the ice and also curse him for setting such a high bar for the rest of the speakers tonight. Um, and I'd also like to just echo his gratitude for all of the faculty, the staff, the family, the friends, and of course, my fellow students for making this journey so, so special. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a story about a philosophical crisis. It was the day before Thanksgiving in fluid mechanics class, and one of the things that we discussed that day was the history of the Reynolds number. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar or who just need a refresher, the Reynolds number is related to flow state. Basically, you can use the speed of something like water in a pipe to calculate the Reynolds number, which will then predict whether the flow state in that pipe will be laminar or turbulent. And laminar is like smooth and beautiful and peaceful and predictable. And turbulent is chaotic and mixed up and crazy. And the pilot is coming on over the intercom to say fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> so this guy, Osborne Reynolds, in the 1880s in Manchester, did all of these experiments to understand the transition between these two states. Basically, at what speed does laminar flow become turbulent flow? And this is one of those things that's a really big deal, like it's just embedded in the world around you and completely foundational to a field. Um, so uh, 100 years after Reynolds did his experiments, a bunch of scientists got together and said, hey, like, let's celebrate this guy and his legacy. Let's recreate his experiments in Manchester just the way he did them. We'll do happy hour after. It'll be great. Uh, so they recreated his experiments, and uh-oh they got different numbers than he did. And in science, if you cannot reproduce your results, that is truly awful for your research. <laughs> uh, everybody was freaking out. They're like, why is this happening? Has this guy been wrong the whole time? And did we just like trust him? Like what is going on? <laughs> so in the pursuit of figuring out like why these numbers were different, these scientists realized that basically, in the past 100 years, Manchester had industrialized. Instead of horse-drawn buggies on the roads, you have cars and trains, and you have a subway system now. And all of this energy that all of those things added to the background of the city was actually having an impact on the flows in these pipes. Basically, they were becoming turbulent at lower speeds. Um, it was easier for them to become turbulent. And this story had like a really profound impact on me. Something about it resonated so strongly. Um, I lived and continue to live right next to I-5, and when a really heavy truck drives by, the whole house shakes. And I hadn't even conceived that the energy just coming from all those cars could be having an impact, like, not just on like the pipes in the house. I was like, that could be messing me up too. Like, <laughs> I don't know. 
Maybe I was just feeling really personally turbulent at the time, and that is why it had such a big impact, but I think about this story all the time in the context of like nature, the power of what it means to hike 10 miles out into the woods and just have that journey and have that like peace and how grounding that is. I think about it in the context of music, of being in a space filled by sound waves and like this sonic energy, um, and how we can all feel that, like punk shows at the Tractor Tavern and your lungs are just vibrating in your chest with the bass, or really beautiful harmonies that can like fill a room and just send shivers down your back. Uh, my parents have this little five pound chihuahua at home and when I sit down and play the piano, she does this like whole full body, like head thrown back, howling along to the music. And you could probably interpret that as like, I'm a really terrible piano player and she's heckling me. Um, but I honestly think she's just joining in to like feel and create the musical energy within the space. So that was my philosophical crisis. It's kind of a lot to stem from not even 10 minutes of lecture two years ago. Uh, but I'm telling you the story because I think it's honestly really emblematic of the power of an engineering degree. Since taking all of these classes, I see the world around me very differently. When I'm walking to school in the morning, I pay attention now to like the distance intervals that they pour the concrete slabs in the road in order to like, and like where they place the manholes so that the concrete cracks the right way. And like, I know that it's concrete and not cement because if like there's one thing that you learn in a civil engineering education, it's that. Um. <laughs> My parents love to go on road trips with me now. I mean, I think they liked to before, but like now I can point out erosion control measures or like landslide scars. And I think it's just a fun like little bit of bonus content to keep the drive interesting. Uh, I really think it's almost a superpower that now everyone graduating in this room tonight has the power to see their environment in that way. Uh, to understand the natural processes and the human intentions that made the world the way it is and to know how it's impacting us. It's such a beautiful skill that we all possess now. And I sincerely hope that all of us, armed with the knowledge and the perspective uh, of that, can go forward to build better communities and to, and to fix the mistakes that those in the past made. It's a really big responsibility, but I fully believe that everyone graduating in this room tonight are capable of harnessing that power to achieve incredible things. Also, you can be like me and just ignore your responsibilities for the next six months to goof off and learn how to roller skate. Whatever is going to make you happiest. Thank you. All right, we'll now actually move on to some student awards. And the faculty who was actually invited to hand that one out is stuck in the tunnel in Ballard, where he was taking students today for a field trip. Um, apparently, I mean, they're all fine. They, <laughs> let, me, let me start with that. Everybody is fine. But if I'm not mistaken, they went down, something went wrong with the drill machine, and then all the crews had to get in, and they couldn't get out. So. He's not here, so I will do the honors. So the first student prize that we'll award is the Neil and Ann Hawkins Prize, which is awarded for outstanding, to outstanding seniors for scholarship, leadership, and communication abilities. The award is voted on by the whole faculty and is awarded to two students. And I have to. <laughs> first, I would like to invite up at the podium, Ed Kelly. Ed, thank you for all you've done for the department. And you have the runner-up prize for the Neil and Ann Hawkins Award for 2023. Thank you. All 
All right. For the first award for the Hawking's Prize, I'm calling Ingrid back to the stage. <laughs> Also, there's a monetary value attached to the award, so it's not just a piece of paper. So, congratulations. <laughs> just as background for the award, Neil Hawkins was a longtime faculty member in our department and also department chair. And after he retired, he basically um, donated funds for this award, uh, which has been awarded ever since. All right, the next award, it's actually my pleasure to invite Professor Alex Horner-Devine to join me here to present two departmental student awards. Professor Horner-Devine is also a departmental uh, associate chair and chairs the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Hi everyone, welcome, congratulations. Um, so civil and environmental engineers are increasingly recognizing the importance of developing meaningful, effective solutions whose impacts are felt equitably across broad and diverse segments of society. In CEE, we're training engineers to meet these challenges. We believe that diversity, equity, and inclusion are necessary for excellent and impactful engineering solutions, and efforts to advance these objectives are thus core to our uh, core components of our work. This year, CE is recognizing two students for their exceptional contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusion in our department. The first DEI student award goes to Abigail Murray. Abby is a current graduate student in the Construction, Energy, and Sustainable Infrastructure Group working and working with her advisor, Dr. Bethany Gordon, on water infrastructure impacts on unhoused populations. She's graduate student advisory board co-chair she leads their DEI committee and is a member of the departmental DEI committee. Uh, from her nomination letter, her passion and purpose are clear to anyone who interacts with her. She's not afraid to speak her mind and show up to meetings and places where she can make the biggest impact with her voice. As chair of the CE DEI committee, I had the pleasure to work directly with Abby and appreciate her commitment, communication skills, and leadership. Um, since Abby's not graduating yet, luckily we get to keep her around for a little bit longer, and that also means she's not here to receive this award. Um, I'll also note that she is a member of the uh, CE Championship Intramural Frisbee team, several other members of which may be here. Um, the second DEI student award goes to Ingrid Phillips. <laughs> Come on back up, Ingrid. Ingrid's a senior, and she's graduating today. She's on the Undergraduate Student Advisory Board and the Departmental DEI Committee. Committee discussions early in the year identified a need to gauge the climate in the undergraduate community, and we asked Ingrid if she'd be willing to help us design that effort. A little bit longer, sorry. She soon convinced us that instead she should lead it and that the effort would be more meaningful if it was organized and run by the Undergraduate Student Advisory Board. She and her student colleagues took this on and organized the whole event. When they felt they needed more input, they designed a follow-up survey for, uh, for the undergraduate community, the results of which Ingrid presented to the CE faculty meeting in our most recent faculty meeting, CE faculty in most recent faculty meeting. Ingrid has a rare combination of initiative, organization, and outstanding capability. Um, and she's a great speech maker and loves the Reynolds experiment. Um, Ingrid, I'm very grateful for your contributions to CE, and I'm excited to see where your energy takes you next. Thank you, Alex, and congratulations to Abby and Ingrid. At this time, it's my great pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker, Alex Radcliffe. When I was tasked with finding a commencement speaker, 
I quickly decided that I wanted to invite one of our recent alumni, someone who's well on their way in their professional career, but who can vividly remember what it was like to sit where you are, except it was in the hub, not here. Um, Alex Radcliffe, who received his Bachelor of Science in Environmental Engineering in 2019, was an obvious choice. Alex graduated magna cum laude with the inaugural cohort of the Bachelor of Science in Env Environmental Engineering program, earning departmental honors, Husky 100 recognition, and the Dean's Medal from the College of Engineering. Alex is a lead engineer with P PAE Consulting Engineers in Seattle, where he oversees the design of sustainable mechanical and plumbing systems for residential, commercial, and institutional projects. In his work, Alex has contributed to the design of several campus buildings, including the Hans Rosling Center for Population Health, the Health Sciences Education Building, and the Interdisciplinary Engineering Building, which is currently under construction. Other notable projects include the Seattle Aquarium Ocean Pavilion, which will open in 2025, and the Concourse C expansion of the Port of Seattle, which opens in 2027. Well, slated to open in 2027. Alex tries to engineer buildings that produce 80 to 90% fewer carbon emissions when compared to conventional infrastructure. Clearly, his work is well aligned with the grand challenges in our department's strategic plan. Please join me in welcoming Alex to the podium. Hello, everybody. Um, so, as Bart said, my name is Alexander Ratcliffe. I'm a department and alumnus, Husky 100, and Dean's Medalist from the 2019 class of the Bachelor's in Environmental Engineering program, the first cohort of students that graduated from that degree. I'm currently a mechanical engineer with PAE Consulting Engineers, designing high-performance buildings and net-zero HVAC and plumbing systems in the greater Seattle area, and as Bart said, fortunate enough to have worked at the university on a few of the buildings here. And despite all that time that I spend here, it's still wonderful to be back. I want to thank the Dean for their generous invitation to speak today. This department has given me so much, and it feels wonderful to express even a fraction of my gratitude. The professors and staff here have created an incredible learning environment, supportive, diverse, intentional, and as a student, I couldn't fully consider just how hard it must have been to run a program like this, and how remarkable it is to have a group of individuals who are so invested in seeing other people grow and succeed. <clears throat> I could say this a thousand times over, but faculty, staff, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for everything that you do. <laughs> Next, I want to acknowledge the parents, family, friends, partners, loved ones, anyone who supported the students on their journey here. Their accomplishments is, are shared by everyone. It was made possible by all of the hands that helped along the way, or the words of encouragement and support, and especially for the sacrifices that you all must have made on behalf of these students. Their success is also a testament to your success, and everyone here should feel proud. And lastly, the reason that we're gathered here today, the students. Congratulations. You just earned yourself a golden ticket from one of the best universities in the world. <laughs> Not only does this diploma show your proficiency in one of the two fastest growing and most important engineering fields, it also demonstrates that you're a problem solver, a critical thinker, considers many factors, can find an answer without all of the variables, and you're resilient. These traits will be invaluable to you as you move forward in life and also means that you're versatile enough to be successful in whatever path or field that you choose. Four years ago, I was fortunate enough to deliver the student's reflection at my own graduation ceremony. On top of my studies, I'd spent much of my college career working on campus uh, infrastructure through extracurricular projects and grant funding. I primarily installed solar arrays with the UW Solar Student Group and led the design for our cohort's group project, which was a constructed wetland that was to be installed on campus and got shelved right before we graduated. For working hard and for graduating with honors, I was given the opportunity to speak here on behalf of the environmental cohort. I chose to speak about climate change. It was topical, applicable to the audience, 
fairly good basis for some words of inspiration. And I wanted to speak from the heart, and I wanted to have real emotion behind it. And somehow I'd confuse that with winging it. <laughs> so I brought up a few sticky notes with me and delivered a doomsday speech, predicting the effects of climate change and emphasizing how desperate our situation really was. On those stickies, I'd listed out a series of major catastrophes that could occur if the Earth were to warm, half a degree Fahrenheit, longer and more intense wildfires, at one degree Fahrenheit, drought, famine, mass human migration, and at two degrees Fahrenheit, island nations swallowed whole by the sea. And that was the extent of my preparation. I'd left the solutions section entirely blank. I tried turning it into a pretty clever metaphor, that was as far as I'd gotten because we haven't found a solution to climate change just yet. We don't know how we'll overcome this obstacle. But congratulations, everyone. Let's get to work. Not very inspirational. It was not exactly what I'd hoped to convey. So I walked back to my seat with my head down, my stomach in knots, thinking of all the things that I wish I would have said differently. Not only did it feel like I'd squandered an opportunity, it felt like I'd brought everyone down with me a blight on what otherwise would have been a joyous day. Friends and family would tell me that they enjoyed the speech, but I couldn't be convinced otherwise. To me, it felt like a failure, evidence that maybe I shouldn't have been up there in the first place. And for all my wanting, I wouldn't get the chance to do it over, and that was something that I struggled to accept. This isn't going to go how you think it is. <laughs> you can imagine my surprise a few months ago when the department graciously offered me a second chance. I was flattered, and on paper it seemed like a perfect opportunity, and that I would have jumped in with both feet. But that's not how it went. Instead, the invitation triggered a very familiar thought pattern, and my immediate reaction was to start telling myself things. I don't deserve this. And school had made a mistake. What had I done in the last four years that warranted something like this? Nothing. I wasn't fit to be the keynote speaker, and my stumbling through that first speech had really only proved that. How cruel are you to have convinced these people that you're something that you're not? And the spiral, the rush of negativity and self-judgment was something that was very familiar, something that had come to define much of my life. Before I continue, um, please know that what follows is a very personal story, it includes some very heavy topics, including both depression and self-harm, these truths are things that are difficult for me to accept and for me to share with the people even closest with me, but decided to share it all with a thousand strangers in an arena that I've never been in before. <laughs> this was my journey. The healing was my own. It may not apply to you. And for anyone struggling in similar ways, I hope that you can find the support and the, need, the help that you need. Vulnerability is the most beautiful thing in this world, and I encourage you to speak up and ask for help. One second. I was 14 years old when I made my first attempt. I was upset. I don't quite remember what I was upset about, but I remember how I felt. I wanted it to be over. I was barely a teenager, and I convinced myself that my life could amount to nothing, or honestly, that my being alive would only hurt other people. That any positive that I could bring in the world would be outweighed by whatever harm that I caused. So. I applied a permanent solution to what felt like a permanent problem at the time, at least a 14-year-old me. Evidently, I'm still here, but it left an impression. Moving forward, that very act would always present itself as an option to solve my problems whenever things got too hard. I'd been suffering for a few years before that attempt, probably more than I even realized today, showing signs of depre depression, anxiety, intentionally acting out, trying to make my life harder for the people around me for no real reason. I've been crafting a narrative, unconsciously, but actively. A narrative, and that narrative was a lens that I used to make sense of the world. I didn't like the main character. Frankly, I hated him. He wasn't very intelligent, or attractive, or cool. He was a braggart, talked too much, made other people uncomfortable. Most people didn't like him. They wouldn't tell him that, at least not to his face, but it was true. It was rotten, evil, almost. 
very quickly turned into a vicious cycle. When life went awry, or I was feeling poorly about myself, it fed this narrative, evidence to support its validity. And when things would challenge that narrative, whether they were commendations, compliments, general success, they would be dismissed. Couldn't be true. Must have been fraud. No way. And by the time that I was just 14, I thought that narrative had been proven true. Enough evidence was collected, mountain of memories, regrets. I was a burden to the people around me, and not only would I not be missed, people would come to appreciate that I was gone. They would realize that they were better off without me. So, while those thoughts repeated over and over and over and over, I opened a door to, the un to another side and left it ajar on the way back in. Didn't make much sense. I was intelligent, successful in school, privileged, had a loyal group of friends, active in sports, had a wonderful girlfriend at the time. By all accounts, I should have been happy. There were people in other circumstances than me that could find joy, or excuse me, worse circumstances than me that could find joy and contentment. And yet I couldn't. That only strengthened the argument that was in my head. When all signs pointed out, when all signs pointed otherwise, I still didn't feel good about myself. And of course there had to be something wrong with me. Despite my protests, life continued on. In adolescence, I learned how to rely on other people for my own self-worth. If I mattered to someone else, whether that be friends or a partner or the popular kids that I was trying to impress, then maybe I could get by without mattering to myself. It was flawed, of course, yielding your emotional state to other people, incidentally putting your life into their hands, constantly looking for evidence that they'd changed their mind about you, that they'd finally seen the real you and didn't like it either. I was incredibly fragile. Confidence was built up like a house of cards. And one I often felt hurt because my thin skin would easily rupture. That same narrative would come forward and direct my emotional response. It became so natural, a knee-jerk reaction, considered just about every day, even in the happiest of times. Over the course of my high school career, I would make several more attempts, varying ser seriousness, but I made it through, a little bit worse for wear. I left home for Seattle, hoping that the change in scenery would bring about a change in myself. Instead, it exposed just how vulnerable I could be. Cut off from that network of external validation that I'd carefully curated, I felt alone, in an, alone, lost and alone in an immeasurable crowd of 50,000 people. Social anxiety and self-consciousness keeping me in my shell, and coupled with the stresses of the difficult coursework that we have to do for engineering, I receded into myself for that first year. Kept up a facade of a happy-go-lucky, confident individual, but I was suffering. And at the time, suicidal ideation was all-consuming. Numb to the world around me, but at the very least, surviving. Towards the end of that first year, though, I found stability in new places. I started work with the UW Solar Group, group learned about the coming environmental engineering program, and found that if I dedicated my time and my efforts towards issues larger than myself, then it felt like I mattered. That maybe, just maybe, I could create enough good and would suddenly feel better about myself. It became a great outlet for when I wasn't feeling well, one that I still employ today. When things in life got hard, I would distract myself, work towards a collective future, and ignore my own discontent. It worked, truthfully, but it was a dependence nonetheless. I would expect so much out of myself, the need to make a tangible difference in a fight against climate change, the only way to make something of value out of myself. But it was beyond me. The problem was so large and overwhelming, and that narrative would come back with its teeth. Was I really making a difference? How much good would a solar array atop Maple Hall really do? Does any of this actually amount to anything? Will my studies be worth anything in the end? Or was I still wasting my time and my efforts and that of the people around me? And the attempts continued. No matter the success, no matter the commendation, and awards, recognition, 
Inside, I felt terrible. My last and most serious attempt came at the end, just three weeks before graduation. I wasn't ready. I had gone through hell just to get to this point, and all I could see before me was more strife, more struggle, challenges, and behind me was another mountain of regrets and things that I'd wish I'd done differently. I couldn't face it. But thank goodness that I had a really great group of friends who cared for me and brought me home and kept me safe that night. And when I woke the next day, ashamed and embarrassed, not the first time that the people around me had helped me through something like this, I truly felt the care from those people for the very first time and felt more resolved than ever before to get better. And as it does, life moved forward. I was carried along with it. Still a shadow of myself and who I wanted to be, but more present than before. It wasn't until I was 25 that something finally shifted. Not even a year ago, for those of you who are keeping track. I spent my time after graduation purposefully getting to know myself, intentionally looking inward, although it terrified me, because confronting my misery was the only real way to address it and the only option left. Within the safe environments afforded by friends, a senior dog that I'd rescued and was by my side, and a career that satisfied my need for meaning and purpose, I started pulling back the truths, layer by layer. I started listening to myself. Rather than flee or fight or reject those feelings that make you feel bad, I spent time with them, nourished them, discovering why it was that I reacted in the way that I did. At 25, I'd started living alone for the first time in my life, tail end of a very dark and challenging winter, one that included the passing of my dear emotional support dog, traumatic end to a serious relationship, and a car accident that isolated me in my apartment away from my friends and family that I'd learned to rely on. So in that darkness and in that loneliness, that negative vortex returned at full strength. There was no more distractions this time. I could only listen. These things are happening to you for a reason. You deserve to suffer, and you always have. Who could miss you? Things will never get better. You will never get better. This is the end. And finally, with all the force that I could muster, a scared little voice from inside me raised up and said, no, that's enough. None of that is true. I don't believe these things that I'm telling myself. And for the first time, genuinely the first time, I felt it. I believed it. I was okay. I was a good person. I deserved the love and the happiness and the joy that I've been rejecting for so long simply because I was me. And in that instant, <laughs> thank you. And in that instant, it opened up the floodgates, both metaphorically and physically. I wept. Oh my goodness, did I cry. Tears of joy, tears of sadness, crying out in grief for all the years that I'd spent in self-pity and admonishment, lifetime spent avoiding the light just because I was more comfortable in the darkness. That feeling of bliss didn't last, of course, but it was enough. Something had changed. That dark cloud by my side wasn't permanent anymore. And so, a few months ago, when the invitation to speak here today brought forward those negative thoughts once again and made me question my self-worth, much easier to pause and tell myself, you're okay. You deserve it this time. You can, and you should, and there's a good reason you're invited here again. The last time is done, it happened, but it's a new day and a new you, and you're not doomed to repeat the past. There was no violence, no war raging inside. It wasn't a battle between good and evil thoughts, things that I was trying to keep from myself. It was gentle. It was acceptance. It's a choice of where to focus your thought and your attention. Choosing to accept myself and my history and for every facet of my being. I'm not the person today that I was four years ago. That much is clear. But I'm also not the same person that I was yesterday. And I surely won't be the same tomorrow. 
You might not have that same dramatic ego death in the next few years, maybe, but you will change, and the people around you will change. We're shaped by our experiences, millions of little moments every single day that form your narrative, crafting that lens with which you view the world. It's so easy to get caught up in the past, to tell yourself, if only I'd known back then what I know now, maybe I would have made different choices, spent my days in other ways, investing in better habits, not caring so much about temporary things, and maybe my life today would be easier. Woe is me for the place that I find myself. The Ojibwe First Nation people of the Great Lakes have a saying. Sometimes I go about in pity for myself, and all the while, a great wind carries me across the sky. I spent 25 years begrudging the circumstances of my life, focusing on the events of my past as a reason to avoid the future, so intent on living in my head that I was ignorant of life happening around me. And those years are gone. Life moved forward. No matter how much I wish I could go back in time, no matter how much I wish I could tell myself that it was going to be okay, and just hold on a little bit longer, I'm here. And I can only be here. And that leaves me two options. <laughs> I could continue living as I had, head facing downward and lamenting the time that I was lost, or I can learn how to let go, accept what happened, recognize that everything had to happen exactly as it had in order for me to be here today. One path led to misery, and the other one led to peace. Four years ago, I delivered a speech that reflected my consciousness at the time. I saw climate change as a fight for survival, a fight that I had been, um, a fight of something that I've been doing every single day. I was expecting the worst outcomes, mentally preparing for the doom and the destruction that was to come. It felt hopeless, and it felt like it had already accepted its fate. But now the story is different. I feel hopeful. I can't exactly explain why, but yet I do. I can see beauty. I see reasons to celebrate all the little victories, the steps in the right direction, regardless of how small they can be. I see a new future, one that has peace and joy and is a beautifully green planet, one built off hope and wonder and humility, and one that is damn appreciative to still be alive. Your position, graduates, is not an easy one. Climate change just may be the greatest challenge we as a species has ever faced and it may come to define many of your futures. But that is true regardless of any want for it to be otherwise. And this is your moment, and you can choose to put your head down and focus on that sorrow, or you can turn with your back towards the wind, accept the situation for what it is, and continue forward resolute and unhindered. Choosing to be hopeful because you have that choice. We're all deluding ourselves in some way telling us ourselves stories that only exist in our head. So why not choose happiness? Many of you are here because you felt called to fight the good fight, to try to make the world a better place. And you may not realize just how well positioned you are. Civil and environmental engineers have more influence over society than many people recognize. There is no energy, there is no water, there is no transportation network that hasn't been touched by one of our engineers constantly working behind the scenes, creating the foundations for a society that may not appreciate your role. And from that point, you can exert, exert more influence and impact more change than many could even dream of. By your passion, you can bring clean water to disadvantaged communities, create structures for people to grow and learn in, <clears throat> and clean the air and the water and the soils that support us. There may be no role more important than ours moving forward. So much of the world is outside of your control, but what happens in here is completely separate. You can choose your own narrative, and in the face of tragedy, you can tell yourself, I'm okay, I'll get through this. I've been here before, and it won't stop me this time. And it only matters that you believe that. So please, all of you, go forward, be in this moment, and find that joy inside. Laugh at your mistakes, Forgive yourselves, forgive the people around you, accept the past and everything else outside of your control, 
and step into this next chapter with the unshakable belief and the confidence that you are exactly where you are meant to be right now. Congratulations to the class of 2023. I can't wait to see the worlds that you build. Thank you. <laughs>
For the first time since 2019, they traveled with their canoe to the annual ASCE Pacific Northwest Student Symposium in Bozeman, Montana to compete against other schools. And they swept the floor. First place in technical presentation, canoe aesthetics, and project proposal. First, second, and third place, women's sprint, co-ed sprint, and men's sprint races, respectively. And the coveted first place overall award, all after a three-year hiatus. We are all so proud of Concrete Canoe. And we wish you the absolute best of luck at the national finals in Platteville, Wisconsin next weekend. All right. And finally, the Steel Bridge team, that's my club, uh, made a comeback after not having built a bridge since 2019. Attending the ASCE Student Symposium alongside Concrete Canoe, the bridge passed all of its tests, earned third place in stiffness, fourth place overall, and was invited to compete at the national finals in San Diego, happening right now. Remember those six names I mentioned at the beginning of the speech? Those are my teammates who attended the competition with me. A few of them are here right now, and the others are watching this live stream from San Diego. Thank you all so much for your dedication to Steelbridge and for being such wonderful friends. And to the entire club, I'm so proud of all of you. Yay, Steelbridge! <laughs> If there's any big takeaway from all this, any unsolicited advice that I could give you all, it's never underestimate the power of teamwork and community. Look at all the things we've built, the people we've helped, and the lessons we've learned, all because we've been working together. And don't underestimate yourself either. I'm guilty of that. Four years ago, I was just graduating high school, and I didn't really care what was going to happen at college. I just wanted to get out of high school. Believe it or not, I was super quiet. <laughs> I got teased for being weird, I didn't have a ton of friends, and I just didn't really belong anywhere. But then I came to UW, joined civil engineering, and met all of these kind, intelligent people sitting in front of me right now. Never would I have thought that here in the CEE community I would learn the most life-changing lessons, gain the most valuable friendships, make the most special memories, and have to say some of the hardest goodbyes. And all of that is because of the community that we have built together. So, if you ever feel like you're not capable enough, like you don't belong anywhere, like you don't have value, think again. Remember your time here and think about all the obstacles we faced and the challenges we overcame just to get our education. Civil engineering relies not only on math and science, but also communication, empathy, and teamwork. And together, as civil engineers and as people, we have the power to change the world. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kaylee. All right, enough speeches. We now move forward. <laughs> I'm getting applause from over there. <laughs> we now move forward with the presentation of graduates. As we invite our graduates to walk across the podium, feel free to make some noise and give voice to your support for our graduates. With that, I proudly present the Civil and Environmental Engineering Class of 2023. Will the Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering degree candidates please stand up? All right. So BSCE students, you will now be dismissed one row at a time to come and stay on the stage single file. So with that, let's get going. Who is it? Who are the name readers? Who's gonna read names? Clara Dunn.
Cassie Starr. Beatrice Muniz Silva. Julia Bossis. Mo Lawal. Evan Bovard. Adam Bogue. Chanchai Barakitsambun. Mustafa Buliki. Caitlin Howe. Rohan Serene. Anton Bauer. Carmen Foca. Caitlin Acosta. Brian Zabala. Leo Ginos. Henry Howe. Anthony Lee. Bagat Subedi. Matthew Nason. Etienne Zanketa. Kaylee Mattingly. Chuhan Pan. Basil Kipotnik. Daniel Senia. Zachary Perdue. Shane Ritchie. Benjamin Logan. Daria Nemchinova. Uchena Achono. Tay Wynn. Gabrielle Barlock. Ingrid Phillips. Jack Kalasvari. Matthew Wagner. Lillian Cherokino. Evan Winans. Grace Collins. Joseph Lakey. Jack Reinmuth. Samantha Parker. Sophie Van Alsberg. Kira Twitchell. Alexandra Meller. Gilbert Noverio. Stephen Jira Lim. Cheyenne Zhang. Michelle Rosales. Angle Corpus.
Dee Young Lee. Min Tran. Alyssa Reyes. Kevin Sun. Marco Castillo. RJ Giao. Bennett Krisno. Eugene Kim. Chris Kim. Gary Hong. Wilson Wang. Kendra Much. Adrian Ong. Angeline Francisco. Hannah Christensen. John Gregory. Alex Jack. Christopher Shaw. Sydney Colburn. Henry Watson. David Usher. Eric Lee. Colleen Hong. Gary Tran. Nicholas Casiola. Jordan Accomando. John Pham. Michael Zane. Matthew Sosano Prado. Cooper Lehman. Isabel Yamashita. Olivia Yamashita. Chloe Jackson. Sophia Belaski. Brandon Lee. Vincent Wynn. Andrew Wang. Edward Kelly. Muhammad Al Arab. Hansen Wynn. Nicola Rosso. Nick Osmondson. Cameron Stewart. Jacob Dirks. Nellie Sundstrom. Lauren Campbell. Astrid Bowden. 
Lila Munn. Lila! Jorge Riancho. Daniel Sucata. Edward Abigania. Danny No. Joey Baxter. Andrew Brown. Esmat Allah Amin. All right, that was the first batch. I would now like to present the Bachelor of Science in Environmental Engineering degree candidates. With the BSMV candidates, please stand up. All right. As before, you'll be dismissed one row at a time. I think there's only two rows, so they should be manageable. Uh, to come on the stage in single file, please. Um, yeah. No, <laughs> I think. Lily Weingartner. <laughs> Royal Stevens. Curtis Anderson. Annika Prom. Liz Morales. Lauren Sophia Grace Whitcock. Julia Fudge. Ellie Ellefson. Maya Vita. Jessica Deximer. Daniel Akbar Germani. Zachary Yak, your bitch in Loman. Adrian Pawa. Hao Zhao Hong. Jameson Smith. All right. Moving on to our graduate students. I would now like to present the Master of Science in Civil Engineering degree candidates. With the MSCE students, please stand up. All right. As before, you'll be dismissed one row at a time, and I'll meet you over here. Wiesner.
Yin Shun Ko. Stefan Conan. Pranati Avasti. Vaibhavi Lakshi Sigu. Drewville Patel. Jeffrey Carlson. Tammy Kang. Jack Fontaine. Daniel Trong. Jenny Chan. Wan Ying Zeng. Tong Mai. Derek Olson. Adam Bryant. Rishi Roy. Octave Duclos. Ryan Bader. Chloe McBurney. Edna Machini. Meredith Rents. Devin Lee. Tommy Lee. Yekaterina Ayanova. Amir Khan Aripakan. Francisco Felix. Tom Andrews. Henry Knight. John Paul Gaston. Davis Wright. Mohammed Asakra. Kim Tran. Aliyah Al Hun Aidi. Ava Prajun. Refrino Harvey. Piper Klinger. Steve Brand. Adi Steina. Yvette Pinoche Troncos. Carolina Lizana. Lidsey Cotnor. All right, we have a few more cohorts to go. We're almost there. Next up are the SCTL graduates. I would like to present the Master of Supply Chain Transportation and Logistics degree candidates. Please stand up. All right.
Archana Kumar. Pam Quinn. Fox Bum. Pam. Tony No. Nicole Vibar. Jong Hair. Jv Tran. Dave Hunsaker. All right. I would now like to recognize the Master of Sustainable Transportation degree candidates. Uh, would the MST students please stand up? Mandolin Dewhurst. Arizu Kamali. Tia Martin. Ryan Gunther. Sylvia Crum. Kylie Jones. Casey Bodiger. Ava Marie Muir. Stephen Kuplin. Finally, we get to the doctoral degree candidates. Will the, will the students please approach the stage to be acknowledged? Faculty assisting with hooding, please join your student on stage when their name is called. So. Mengju Tsai. Hao Yang. Hao Yang. I can basically stand in there. Yuzhou Wang. Carolina Reckart.
Min Yong Lee. Ryan Rossinen. Richmond. Jordan C. Wright. Steven Pestana. Shashank Bhushan. <laughs> J. Michelle Hu. Christine Baker. <laughs> Shelby Arndt. Samantha Fung. Gabriela Giron Valderrama.
Jose Luis Machado Leon. Well, as you can see, the most stressful moment for a PhD advisor is the moment you have to fumble with that hood. Um, but we got there in the end. We're inviting the PhDs to remain on the, on the podium for the remainder of the ceremony as we close these proceedings, as a token for them joining us as peers in the academic community. So as my closing remarks, because we really are at the end now, thank you family, friends, and guests for coming and supporting your loved ones through the years and for their part in creating future engineers. One more, once more, congratulations to all of you graduates. I would say, Celebrate and enjoy before you go back to your books or your reports or whatever is due before you get your degree in the coming week. And now the cap toss for those of you who are so inclined. Let's give everyone a second to get their cameras ready and make sure no one loses an eye in the process. So, if you're ready, on three, one, two, three, congratulations. There's no flat. Oh, there we go. All right, and that concludes our commencement ceremony. Thank you all.